the Athenaeum of Philadelphia, which you see virtually behind me. And uh, to let you know, we have reopened our doors to a limited amount of people at a time. If you want to, instead of checking out your books at the vestibule, you can come in and browse. You can register with a uh, test to reserve space if you need a study space for a while. Um, if you would like to get a, a brief tour of a friend who would like a tour to learn more about the Athenaeum, you can register with us and we'll do a socially distant, shorter tours, but just to give you a taste. If you don't know the Athenaeum, uh, it is a, a treat. It is a unique and uh, wonderful place in Philadelphia, which is a circulating library, membership supported, architectural archives and community forum where we gather for learning and conversation and research and um, making friends and building community. And we're so glad you're here tonight as part of our winter speaker series of myself and Tess Galen, our wonderful events coordinator, and tonight's speaker, Simon Winchester, who I will uh, introduce in just a moment. Right now, I want to remind you uh, that for if you, once he starts speaking, if you wanted to see him, if you have a, a laptop, a computer, go to the upper right-hand corner, click for the speaker view. It should just make the person who's speaking be the one that you see. And any questions you have, put into the Q&A, and I will moderate them for you during the Q&A time. But right now, I think most of us know who Simon Winchester is. We've been reading his books for years. He is the acclaimed author, author of many books. If you go and look at his bibliography, you have, I don't know, is it close to 20 or 30 books, Simon? It's, it's, it's amazing the number of books that you have written. Um, he started as a journalist and, and, and turned to longer forms um, to share stories and history uh, that make us all much better informed. He's a fantastic writer. So he's acclaimed author of, of many books, including The Professor and the Madman, which you can reread and then watch on Netflix. The Man, The Men Who, who United the States, The Map That Changed the World, The Man Who Loved China, A Crack in the Edge of the World, and Krakatoa, all of which were New York Times bestsellers. Um, in 2006, Mr. Winchester was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen, which is good to know if you're watching The Crown. Do you have, I don't know if you have a, uh, a walk on in that show or not. And do we need to call you sir at this time as OBE? Um, <laughs> it is such a pleasure to have you here. I wanna turn the screen over to you, invite everybody to give a virtual welcome to Simon Winchester. Well, thank you so much. And as I was explaining at the very beginning, I, I'm in the middle of a book tour where all previous events have been conversations with and this is the first time when I'm sort of solo on my own. So um, I hope it works, I'll cross my fingers. So I'm going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes about this, this book. And um, uh, to tell you, first of all, how it, how it began. I, um, I used to live in Hong Kong and I was a journalist there. And uh, I decided in 1997 when Hong Kong returned to the Chinese, as not unreasonably it should after a hundred odd years of British colonial ownership, um, that I would come either to go and live in England or to go and live in America. And as I had been a correspondent here in the 70s and again in the 80s and had sort of fallen in love with this place, I decided to come to New York. And so I got a little flat in the city and but because I'm sort of a country person and grew up in the countryside in in England, I, um, I decided to, to buy a little house, a little cottage in Dutchess County, New York, about a hundred miles north of the city in a little community called Wasaic. And um, in that little cottage, I, means a great deal to me because that's where I wrote The Professor and the Madman, which was my sort of breakout book. And I was then able to try and earn a living as a writer rather than work for people as a, as a journalist. So I had this little cottage and it had about, I don't know, five acres of garden or something around it. But then there was a man who owned all the surrounding land and he was a plumber who lived in the Bronx, a man called Caesar. And he used to come up each autumn and hunt and very nice man. And he used to thank me for you know, the noise and disruption his hunting would cause by leaving a cooler full of venison and also always a bottle of cognac, which I thought was terribly nice. And um, I liked him and then he came to me after three or so years and said, look, 
although he'd love to come up and hunt occasionally, he was a bit weary of having to pay the taxes on this land. Would I like to buy it? It was about 130 acres. And um, we talked about price and I could just about afford it, thanks to the professor and the madman. So I decided, yes, I would buy it. So all of a sudden I was the owner of 130, that's more or less, acres of Dutchess County landscape, very useless land. It was all on the north face of a mountain. It was very beautiful. It had little streams and rocky crags, but and many, many trees and lots of wildlife. There were moose and deer and bobcats and skunk, unfortunately. And um, I, I, I liked it well enough, but it wasn't anything I could make any practical use of. I couldn't really grow things or have livestock. Um, so a few years later, I um, decided I did actually want to own land on which I could have the odd animal or two and bought the house I'm speaking from now, which is in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, and a little bit of land here and um, sold the house in, um, in Dutchess County, but I kept the land. And that became important to me really in 2011 when I decided to become and applied to become a citizen of the United States and indeed got my citizenship on Independence Day 2011 um, on the after deck of the USS Constitution, a wonderful sailing ship in Boston Harbor. And I'm very moved by that event, but also it suddenly seemed that it seems symbolically important that I was owner of a piece of the United States of America, now the country. I was literally fully invested in the country. So I um, went and visited the land more often and um, decided I would try and learn its history. So I knew I had bought it from this chap called Caesar Luria and he had bought it, his family had bought it in the late 1960s from another family called Bracia and back and back it went until I got to about the 17th century and I got to some early deeds where the person that sought to own it was a Dutchman, it was all written in Dutch, and um, the assent was given by the people who had previously inhabited it, who could not write in English and so affixed either an X or in many cases a, a small drawing of a, of a deer or some antlers or some symbol of the countryside. And it became abundantly clear to me then this, that there was a significant difference between my habitation of the land and the habitation of those people who were Mohican Indians. And they'd sold it to the Dutch who had been led, if you remember your history, up the Hudson River by um, Henry Hudson, who was working for the Dutch. I mean, he was English, but he was on a freelance colonizing expedition by the Dutch. So they were the first people to own the land, but the Mohicans from whom they had taken it or paid money or baubles for it, had never ever had this concept. To them, they inhabited the land and they gathered and they hunted on it, but they regarded ownership as utterly alien to them. I mean, to them, you could no more own the land than you could own the breeze or the ocean. And so I thought that this, now I'm symbolically invested into the United States and I do something which is not in any way similar to the earliest inhabitants of the Americas, insofar as I owned it, I believed I owned it, but they never did. This whole concept of ownership, how did it come about? And I thought this would be a fascinating subject to explore in a sort of non-academic sense, a sense, non-legalistic non sense. And um, so I persuaded my editor, who a very nice lady in New York, that I should do this, but she said, no, yes, do it but don't restrict it to the United States because the concept of ownership, where did it begin in the world? And where is it practiced? How is it practiced? Um, so make this a global book rather than a purely American book. And my English publisher said the same thing. I mean, don't make this only American. And so I signed a contract, I think in about 20, uh, I don't know, 2019, I suppose. And, um, I was off to the races. And that was, of course, back in those heady days, some of you may remember, when you could actually travel. And so I went all over the world investigating this whole question of 
what does ownership actually mean? And um, I realized it was, a, well, it goes without saying, a vast subject, 37 billion acres of the planet, habitable acres, required technically a lot of text, but this book has got to be a manageable size. So how do you corral all the information you like to, 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 to accumulate into readable form? So I decided to divide the book into, into five main categories. One, to, to acquire land, you need to know where it is. And to do that, you've got to survey it, you've got to draw maps, you've got to know where the borders, the edges of the land are. So that would occupy one chapter. Um, how do you get it? How do you get hold of it? You buy it, you steal it, you purloin it, you swap it for something else. So that seemed to me to be interesting as well. And then once you've got it, how do you steward it? How do you look after it or not look after it? How do you ruin it? How do you improve it? And then maybe you, as many ha times happens in world history, it becomes contentious, your ownership of it. And you go to war over it. Innumerable wars are fought over land. And then finally, the original idea that land shouldn't actually be owned by anyone. It should be owned by a people, a community. Is this idea being visited anywhere in the world? Is this what to me seems an eminently sensible idea? Is that being exercised, put into plan? Top and tail it with a prologue relating entirely to my 130 acres and with an epilogue telling a story which seems to sum it all up. And that, I mean, it sounds trite to say, but it took quite a lot of thought, um, was how the book shaped itself. So first then I wrote a great deal about my 130 acres and I decided to look at it from the moment that it wasn't land at all, that it was being formed in sort of Hadean times. And then when the first, um, it used to be, as it happens in the Southern hemisphere, it used to be near where the South Pole is today, but it's now in Dutchess County, New York. And the first vegetation, the first soil, the first life, the first wildlife, then the first people, who were they? They were the Mohicans. Had it been a little further south, it would have been Lenape. Had it been a little further north, it would have been Iroquois. So what happened to them? What sort of people were they? And then look at the human history right up to me signing that lease in a lawyer's office in Kent, Connecticut and becoming um, the person who acquired it. So once having done that, I decided to look in some detail at the whole question of, and it may sound rather technical and boring, how does land, how do you fix the boundaries of land? Where did boundaries first begin? And so I looked into England basically, because an awful lot of stuff relating to land ownership begins in England, which is where I come, come from. And um, what seemed to have happened in the early, early days, let's say the Bronze Age, so we're talking four or 5,000 years ago, when you begin settled agriculture, up to that point, most people in England, anyway, Northern Europe, were nomadic. Now they're settled and they decide they want to plant crops. So they've learned, it sounds somewhat condescending to say so, but these were people who hitherto had no idea of what they were doing. They would carve a little hole in the soil with a sharpened stick, which maybe they had hardened in a fire and sprinkle some seeds into it and water it. And lo and behold, a plant would appear from which might bear fruit or vegetables of some sort which they could eat and what if you then plant a number of holes all in a line what we call a furrow today and develop a tool to do that the early ones were called cashroms because by now in the bronze age you can tip these fire hardened sticks with metal and it becomes quite efficient quite easy to dig a furrow and then you can plant seeds and you get a line of crops with enough fruit or vegetables or whatever for you to sustain your family, but for you to maybe trade, butter or sell to other people. So the beginning of commerce. So let's say there are two Bronze Age farmers, one in the flatlands of a river valley, and his friend is maybe a rival, but just 
up the hillside away, a few hundred yards away. And each morning they would plant their crops and make furrows in which to do so. So let's say farmer A makes his furrows in a north-south line and makes 20 of them. Let's say farmer B on his hillsides follows the contour lines of the hills, because it's easier to go with the hills contours than cut across them. And so his furrows are necessarily not going north-south, but let's say they're going northwest, southeast. And they will at some point intersect with the north-south lines in the way that if you th throw two pebbles into a pond, the ripples will intersect with each other. Well, where they intersect marks the boundary of those two people's lands. The lands, not that they own, but they, that they are superintending, that they are practicing agriculture on. So to make sure that one doesn't stray into the other, you put a line of stones where the two furrows meet, or maybe wattle or some sticks, or maybe you dig a trench or something. But that would have been the first ever boundary in the world. And it would enable farmer A to say, yes, my land stretches up to that line of sticks and farmer B would say the same thing and they would respect it. And those lines then, those mark one farmer off from another, from another but they'd eventually mark, let's say, a, the boundary of a village or a parish, or in later times, a, a county or a prefecture, or indeed a country. And indeed, taking this even further, I like to imagine, for instance, we all know that human civilization began in you know, Old Javai, the East Africa, and that ultimately there were civilizations in the Nile Valley and another one in Mesopotamia and another one in uh, the Indus Valley and what is now India, Pakistan, and another one in the Yellow River Valley. Well, these civilizations spread outwards like um, penicillin in a petri dish. And where they encountered each other, let's say the Nilotic people encountering the Mesopotamian people, all of a sudden, the people from the Nile see people that look completely different from them and who are in fact not Arabs like them, but are in fact what we nowadays call Persians. And maybe they fight with them, maybe they trade with them, whatever. But where they meet is another border. It's an international border, a boundary, a frontier. And I like to think in that specific case, it's probably where the Marsh Arabs live, somewhere near um, oh, Basra in southeastern Iraq. So this whole question of, of, of boundaries and borders, I found absolutely fascinating. And I illustrated it in a way with one particularly tragic, I suppose, um, illustration of this kind of thing. And that was the drawing of the border between what is now India and Pakistan in the 1940s. I don't know how well you know that story, but Britain decides under, of course, enormous pressure, mainly from India, to after two centuries to give up the rule of India. And Lord Mountbatten, related to the monarch in Britain, flies over to be the last viceroy. And all the Indians with whom he negotiates, most notably Gandhi, want India to be one country when it's independent. But Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the leader of the Muslim League, says, no, 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 we've got to create homelands for the Muslim people. And we're going to call them Pakistan. We're going to have West Pakistan in the west of India and East Pakistan in Bengal in the, in the east of the country. So how to draw the border between these two countries? You've only got eight weeks, according to Mountbatten's schedule, before independence is being declared. So Mountbatten gets on the phone and calls this mild-mannered man called Sir Cyril Radcliffe, who's a lawyer from Wales, never been to India in his life. He's never actually been east of Paris. And he said, look, you're a fair-minded man. I'd like you to give you all the maps you might need. I want you to draw a border creating a new country called Pakistan. So Radcliffe um, accepted his duty and flew over to India, immediately fell ill with Delhi Belly, and so was laid low, but they gave him a large mansion up in the cool of the Himalayas in Simla with four assistants who it turns out never spoke to one another and a bunch of out of date maps and demographic figures relating to the population of the villages near where he was going to draw his line. And with his trusty Parker fountain pen, he drew a 1700 mile long 
ink line, which would from the 15th of August, 1947, be the boundary between Pakistan and India. And on the 15th, he then, he didn't really anticipate what was going to happen. But what did happen is that when the flag came down and was replaced in India by the Indian flag and in Pakistan by the Pakistani flag, so people in their millions left for the security of their own religion. So the Hindus who were in Pakistan fled into India and the Muslims that were in India fled into Pakistan. And in doing so, they started killing each other. And two and a half million people died simply because of a line, a border line that had been drawn by this blameless, dutiful, amiable civil servant, Sir Cyril Radcliffe. He was so upset, this bloody line, he called it. He burned all his notes. He refused to accept his fee. He went back to England and never spoke of it again. That line, 1700 miles long, from Karachi effectively right up into the Himalayas, is one of the most heavily guarded borders in the world, illuminated by so many lights that at night, it is one of the only things that can be seen and made by man from the International Space Station. Guarded, remember Pakistan and India now are two nuclear powered nations that have already been at war four times with each other. There is only one entry point, one hole as it were in the entire border at a place called Waga, W-A-G-A-H. And if you've never seen it, I commend you to go to YouTube and look at the gate closing ceremony, which happens every night at six. I mean, I've driven across the Wagga border many times because when I lived in India, I drove my car from London to Delhi and drove across the border and then I had to drive it back and forth. Then in those days, it was routine. That was in the 1970s. Nowadays, it's anything but routine. And if you see this extraordinary ceremony where you've got Indian soldiers from the Indian Border Security Force, the tallest imaginable soldiers with great cockaded hats, and on the other side, the dark uniforms of the Pakistan Rangers, equally huge men with great cockaded hats, marching towards each other, doing sort of Basil Fawlty Ministry of Silly Walks, high stepping, look like they're in the New York Rockettes, walking towards each other, towards the line painted on the road, the line that Radcliffe drew in the 1940s, coming up to each other such that their moustache to quivering moustache, saluting each other, shaking hands over the line and then slamming the gates shut while behind them thousands of Indians and then behind them thousands of Pakistanis gripped with crazed nationalistic fervor cheering them on shouting their dislike for the other side. It's an extraordinary phenomenon and it all devolves on this simple matter of the division of land the creation of borders which evolves from that man in the Bronze Age planting his crops and drawing a line that was somehow different from the line drawn by his colleague. So there's a great deal in the book about that sort of thing, the madness of borders, the surveying of countryside. I mean, I could, even now I see that I've, I've really only covered one, one topic, but in, in the second section of the book, I look at how people acquire land. Well, most land, like the land I acquired, was bought. I mean, I paid money, got some land. Initially, of course, and particularly in this country, it was stolen. It was purloined. It was taken by force of arms. I mean, until 1879, this book, I don't know if many of you have seen it, but it's dedicated, I can actually hold it up on the screen, it's dedicated to a Native American called Standing Bear. And there he is. Standing Bear is a punker from what is now Nebraska. And he went to the Supreme Court in 1879 in order that he be declared a human being, because up to that point, Native Americans were not thought to be human beings, and nor were Aboriginals thought to be human beings in Australia, nor were Maoris thought to be human beings. And if the landscape is not peopled by humans, if these are no more than jackrabbits or March hares or whatever, then the land is theoretically empty, terra nullius, and you can take it. And that's the basis for the settlement, at least in the Eastern United States, the land taken away 
by force of arms or by sort of dodgy legal argument, terra nullius, that there are no people there. Well, of course, we know there were, we know there are. However, there are parts of the world that never belong to anybody. And I was very interested in those. And I'll tell you briefly the story of a place with a very bizarre sort of science fiction -y name called Flavoland, F-L-E-V-O-L-A-N-D, Flavoland. It's in the Netherlands. Netherlands, the low countries, the lowlands. The Netherlands is an extremely vulnerable part of the world, flooding all the time. I mean, the windmills were often used as water pumps. It's full of canals. And until the 1920s, the whole middle of Holland was water, seawater, called the Zuiderzee. It was an inlet of the North Sea. Well, a remarkable man called Cornelis Lely decided that the country would, was tired of drowning and there were phenomenal floods in Holland. So he said the way to stop these floods is to build an enormous dam to prevent the North Sea entering this thing called the Zuiderzee. Took him years, began in the 1920s, but began in the early 1930s. Eventually though, the dam was built and all of a sudden the sea did not come into Holland. And so the Zuiderzee was no longer a Zee, no longer a sea. It was a lake called the Iselmere. And it became, as the years went on, fresh water. It stopped being waves and tides, started evaporating and became fresh. Well, it was at that point that the Dutch decided that they would make new land out of this seawater. The part that I concentrate on is the very south of the, of the Iselmere, just to the east of the city of Amsterdam. So what they did was they made an oblong in the sea, built a series of dams, it was about a million acres. They put walls, dams, temporary dams around it and built six enormous pumps. I mean, just unbelievable pumps that ran night and day for the better part of 10 years. And very slowly, the water levels started to go down and down and down and down and down. And in the 1960s, you can actually see mud appearing, land, the beginnings of land. You couldn't walk on it, you'd go, you know, you'd drown in the mud. But slowly it began to dry out. And they decided then that what they would do to create new land was to fly aircraft over it back and forth, back and forth, seeding it with reeds until it was a forest of reeds, a million acres of reeds. Then they set fire to the reeds. So it was this huge fire to the east of Amsterdam, which produced a layer of ash. And then they laid more reeds. And after about eight years of doing this, they had about six inches of ash on top of the mud and it was beginning to get firm and dry. Then they flew over it again with more aircraft, but this time not seeding it with reeds, but with grass, with very hardy grasses. And the result was that after about 15 years, you had soil. So you've now got a million acres covered with soil, firm enough for you to walk on, create paths on, to bring tractors and excavators and dump trucks tarmac, lay roads, lay a railway line, lay power cables, plan cities, one city anyway, named after Cornelius Lely, Lelystad, and then to announce to the rest of the country, we've created a million acres of land for you. We want you to have it. We're going to rent it to you in 60 acre parcels, and anyone can have it for a nominal fee. And those of you that improve it, in a sort of Jeffersonian way, or Locke was the great the philosopher, Locke said land, if you improve it, it can belong to you. And that's one of the sort of basic principles that lawyers use to this day. So we'll make 60 acre plots out of it. And um, we invite applications for people to take this land. And they put advertisements in the papers in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, in, um, in The Hague, saying anyone that wants to land, they can have it, but we are going to, and this was an extraordinary thing to, to do, we're going to apportion the successful applicants such the demographics of this new land that we've created mirror exactly 
the demographics of Holland as a whole. So 30% of the successful applicants will be Catholic, 30% will be Protestant, 30% will be members of the Dutch Reformed Church, and 10% will be other. And the extraordinary thing is it's worked impeccably. I mean, Flavorland, probably one of the most boring places in the world, but socially utterly stable, the farms hugely productive, the city peaceful and a nice place connected by rail, 35 minutes east of Amsterdam, and not a drop of blood had to be shed in the making and occupying of this land. The same cannot be said of Nebraska, where our Ponca friend came from, cannot be said of Georgia, Alabama, cannot be said of the Dakotas, cannot be said of where Deb Holland comes from, the new Secretary of the Interior, in the, the Pueblos of Southwest Arizona and New Mexico. So it's, it's a triumph of social engineering, but it's also a reminder of how land can and sometimes is created to great effect. It's interesting that when I was looking for the epigraphs of this, for this book, I initially, uh, very poor judgment on my part, chose a paragraph from Gone with the Wind, which is a no-no of a book to quote from these days for obvious reasons. But you may remember, it's right at the beginning, when Gerald O'Hara, whatever his name is, comes on in his white horse, jumping the fence, and there is Scarlett O'Hara, looking dejected and miserable, having failed in yet another love affair. Ashley Wilkes, one assumes. And she says, oh, Father, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell Tara. I'm, I'm leaving. And he says, I won't put on his accent, you cannot leave Tara because land, the land that Tara presides over, is the only thing worth living for, the only thing worth working for, the only thing worth dying for because land is the only thing that lasts. And that was the belief. In the end, we, I wasn't allowed to use that quotation and had to find another one from Anthony Trollope in the 19th century. Land is the only thing which won't fly away. They used to say, did they not? Well, they're not making any more of it. Well, they are. They're making land in Southwestern Manhattan. They're making it all over Hong Kong where I used to live. They're making it in Holland. And what is happening, and that's one of the other interesting stories, is that thanks to global warming and sea level rise, land is no longer as immutable as everyone thought it was because it's being nibbled away. The United States at the moment, trivially, there's a friend of mine watching today, David Fraser and his wife, Amy, I think they're here. Hello, David, if you are, who he, he and I, he's a wonderful photographer, did a book of, um, photographs of, the latest one is on the Mississippi, the one I'm thinking about is on the east coast of the United States. And one of his illustrations is in this book, showing how global warming and sea level rise is nibbling away at the east coast of the United States. We've lost about 13,000 acres, a trivial amount in the last two or three decades, but whole countries are disappearing now. Kiribati, Tuvalu in the Pacific, Bangladesh, um, and indeed, New Zealand has said they will now recognize and accept sea level rise refugees from Pacific Islands that are being drowned by the rising sea levels. So land is not as immutable. I mean, it used to be, after all, one of the reasons that we like owning land is because it's stable, they're quote, not making any more, we know they are, but also once you own it, you can take it to the bank and say, I own 130 acres, use that as surety for a, like to buy a tractor or build a house or buy a car or a television set or whatever. It's the basis of capitalism. So it's hugely important to the economies of most capitalist societies. So I'm going to finish, I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear in a couple of minutes, but I just do want to finish the way I finished the book with a wonderful story, at least I think it's wonderful, by Tolstoy on the question of how much land does a man need? I mean, I should point out that the big landowners in the world, biggest in America, Ted Turner, who owns nearly 2 million acres, John Malone, both of them television impresarios, also owns 2 million, a pair of not particularly pleasant people called the Wilkes brothers, who live in West Texas on a massive shopping spree in the West and own three quarters of a million acres, 
Gina Reinhardt in Australia, the world's biggest landowner, owns 29 million acres. But how much land does a man need? And Tolstoy wrote this charming little story about a man called Pakon, who lived in a village about 200 miles south of Moscow and yearned to own some land. And so a widow in the village had some for sale. And so he bent over backwards to do all he could to own a bit of her land and was able by selling a horse and making some honey, and he was a good farmer, to, uh, to buy maybe 20 acres. So he's now a landowner. And he farmed that land brilliantly such that, and he made such a profit that he was able in two or three years to buy another 30 or so acres. And all the time, Tolstoy, an amusing literary device, had the devil sitting on his shoulder saying, I'm gonna have fun with this man because he's greedy. So he accumulated more and more land such that by the time he was about 45, he had really sort of grandiose ambitions and heard the story of a tribe of quote, primitive people who lived down near the mouth of the Volga and who had land for sale in abundance and he could trick them, he was told, to giving it away at a knockdown price. So he went down the Volga with lots of presents, bottles of vodka and so forth, arrived at this tribe of people and regarded them instantly in a condescending way. They were stupid, he thought. So do you have land? Yes, we do. How much is it? Well, we're selling it at the rate of a thousand rubles a day. You say, what do you mean a day? You don't sell land by the day, you send it, sell it by the acre. No, we don't. We sell it by the day. The amount of land you can walk around in a day, we'll sell you for a thousand rubles. He thought, I'm a fit man. I will get heaps and heaps of land by this device. So they said, fine, meet us on this hillside at six in the morning at sunrise. Off you go, and by the, you've got to be back here exactly by sunset. And then all the land that you've encompassed in your journey is yours for a thousand rubles. So he set off over the hills. By about 10 o'clock, the sun was up. He was getting rather hot. He took his jacket off, discarded it. By 11 o'clock, it was really hot and he was, took his shoes off, which were hurting him anyway. So he's now in bare feet. By midday, he's really burned to a crisp and is very unhappy, but he's, he knows he's getting hundreds and hundreds of acres. So by three o'clock in the afternoon, he's utterly, completely exhausted. His feet are in tatters, his skin is sunburned. He's miserable, but in the far distance, he can see the elders waiting for him, but he's got to be down there by the moment the sun goes down. If he's late, the deal is off. So he then begins to lope and then to run over hills and down dales across rivers. And it's wretched, he's utterly, completely exhausted, but the sun is just edging down over the horizon and he's at the, just by the, the elders and he makes this final dash towards them, collapses in front of the man with the title deed for the land and dies. And wearily, the elders said to the sexton, the man with the shovel, so dig a grave for this man, six feet long and three feet wide, because that is the only amount of land that any man ever needs. So it was perfect. That's all we ever need. We don't need two million acres. We don't need 29 million acres. Six by three will do us nicely. So there we are, that's what all I've got to say. And I hope that if there are any questions, um, I can answer them for you. But uh, otherwise, this has been a great pleasure. Thank you, thank you, Simon. As, um, as, as Jared writes, what a fascinating talk. He says, I could listen to you talk all night. This has just been wonderful. <laughs> and it's a, a great little taste of a book. I finished reading it a couple of weeks ago. And as you're talking, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that part and that part. There's, you, you, you tell stories so wonderfully, both as you're sharing them verbally and, and in your writing. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm positive everybody's gonna love your book. We do have some questions and um, yeah. there's some good ones. So uh, Joe, it looks like has uh, uh, had a chance to dive in and to the book. He says, your description of the land steal from uh, Native Americans in the US is depressing. He wonders, if you have any thoughts about appropriate reparations. 
Yes, well, um, I certainly do, but the place where reparations are being constructively worked on is New Zealand. And um, I write a lot about that. And I think it's so positive and it would be a model for all the other societies where white settlers have taken land away from native peoples, as of course has happened here and in Canada and in Australia in tragic form. In New Zealand, basically, New Zealand is the most recently settled piece of real estate on the planet. I mean, there were no people there at all 700 years ago. And then Polynesians came down, they divided, they became a subset of Polynesia, the Maoris, and um, they occupied it until, lo and behold, the British turned up as they invariably do, with the French as rivals, but we the British saw off the French. And so we in 1840 signed an agreement, the Treaty of Waitangi it's called, which every New Zealand child knows all about, um, with representatives of some of 60 or 70 of the Maori families. And that therefore ceded sovereignty of all the land in New Zealand to Queen Victoria, who had by then been what, three years on the throne, I suppose. And that has been the situation ever since until the 1970s, when New Zealand, which up to that point was like a little England in the South Seas. I mean, they played cricket and they drank warm beer and they threw daffodils and played lawn bowls and sang God Save the Queen or God Save the King, depending on what the monarch was in London. Everything changed. And largely due to this wonderful old lady called Fina, it looks spelt Wiener, W-H-I-N-A, but it's pronounced Fina Cooper, who was an extraordinary woman in and of herself, but she devoted her later years to reversing the ills of um, what the Maoris had suffered and led a long land march from the very northern tip of the North Island down to the government headquarters in Wellington in New Zealand and started a movement which has never stopped since in giving sovereignty back to the Maoris. And it's happening. There's now the Maori Land Court and there's the Waitangi Tribunal. And all over the place, Maori ownership is being regained or compensation is being paid. It's far from ideal. There's a lot of grumpy Maoris who say, well, we haven't got our land back yet. But compared to what is not happening in the United States, where the Indians are quite reasonably miserable beyond belief for their brutal dispossession. Something is happening in New Zealand and it's similarly beginning to happen in Australia. And I hope the infection, if I can call it that, will spread to this country. I'm the moderator, the elected moderator, would you believe, of this little village I live in. So I have to preside over the town meeting. That is the way we run our affairs up here. And um, every May and at every special town meeting, I begin by pledging allegiance, which of course as an Englishman I had to learn and I always stumble over it. But then I would say, because I learned this in, in New Zealand, I'd like everyone to remain standing for a moment to memorialize the people whose lands these really are, the Mohican Indians who were shoved off and they're now living in Wisconsin. And they, people were sort of embarrassed and said, what is this person doing? But they, they've now accepted it. And it's spread to other communities in New England, or at least in Massachusetts. And slowly, I think very, very slowly, glacially slowly, there's a new acceptance that we are the guests of the Native Americans in this country and we should treat them and their lands with more respect. It's happened in New Zealand, it could happen here. Thank you, fantastic. Um... Laura is curious what the system for land, land use was before farming was the system for land use. You mean before, you mean in this country or worldwide? It just says before farming, she says before farming, what was the system for land use, fishing, hunting, etc. So maybe well, if you want to pick one, you know, you, you speak about the, the, the Native Americans that lived in, in, in the Yosemite Valley, for example. or, or Yes, well, indeed. I mean, it, it was before, before settled agriculture, it was no nomadism and hunting and gathering. Um, 
which, I, I mean, an illustration, however, of the sophistication of this came when, and go back to the South Pacific for a moment, Captain Cook, having initially found New Zealand, then came on to Botany Bay, just south of um, where Sydney is now, and Joseph Banks, who was the botanist on board, because for all the ills of the British Empire, um, we carried a lot of people who simply wanted to inquire what plants, what animals and so forth. So Joseph Banks immediately said, bearing in mind that no European had ever been to this continent before, they didn't know it was a continent, but this part of the world, that it looks like an English parkland. The forests have been cleared, there are groves of flowers, groves, I mean, it looked, he said, like a, a gentleman's estate in Northamptonshire. The people that farmed it, who were, as it turned out, the first ones that Cook encountered were very, very hostile to him. And one of his, I think he, of course, typically British, went and shot one of them, which didn't help things. Um, and he went up north and his ship was stranded and the Aboriginals in that part of Australia were more well, well disposed. But he came away thinking, that these are a sophisticated people. And this was much the more tolerant of the settlers that came to Massachusetts or Virginia in the early in the 16th, 17th centuries. They found much the same thing. Nonetheless, the idea was that these couldn't possibly be human beings. They would you know, we'll enslave them or we'll treat them poorly and not give them civil rights. I mean, it's an incredible thought that Native Americans, this is their country after all, didn't get the vote until 1924. I, I just find that quite incredible, but that's making a political point which is rather beyond the scope of the book. The story is that settled agriculture came to Australia, Canada, America, pretty early on after hunting and gathering had, 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 its, had, had its day. Thank you. Um, Lily notes that in Hawaii, there is a sovereignty movement that is being led by the grandmothers. So um, we do have some place in, in the United States that that is happening, which is wonderful. Um, she also says, thank you for uh, such a fascinating talk uh, and notes that paintings of the quote landscape grew in popularity in European art from the 16th century, coincident with European colonizing endeavors. And wondering if you could comment on how representations of land, such as the 17th century Dutch, might have informed European attitudes to colonization. Well, hugely. I mean, I'm no great student of or expert on art, but I mean, people like Constable in England and, of course, the great Hudson River School uh, people in the United States, these magnificent uh, landscapes that were drawn of Yosemite in California, the Hudson River in, in this country and the Cotswold, Salisbury Cathedral, whatever, in, in Southwest England, all attest, with the possible exception of Salisbury Cathedral, I really shouldn't have mentioned it, to the magnificence of the landscape and the puniness of humankind. I mean, humanity was secondary to the magnificence of the countryside, but this unfortunately led to something which I thought was very dangerous. And, um, I'm very interested in a group in London called Survival International, which campaigns not like the World Wildlife Fund, which is you know, for pandas and things like that, but for people, threatened, endangered people. Obviously, most of their work is being done for the people in the Brazilian rainforest, particularly the tribes with very little contact. Protect them. Don't do what Bolsonaro and his gang are doing, which is just to ride roughshod over them. And um, their influence over the land is, is completely fascinating. And in America, what I, the point I wanted to make was that John Muir, who we all revere, regarded the land, this magnificent landscape, El Capitan, Half Dome, the waterfalls, Bridal Veil, kind of stuff you see. He said, this is the work of God. Yosemite is a cathedral should be cleansed of mankind. And he wanted the Miwok, these people that had been harvesting in the lower, the valley of the Yosemite, to be thrown out. I mean, he was very much a eugenicist, was, was John Muir. 
And he did, I think, an awful lot of damage to relations between white people and Native Americans. And the only Miwok he would allow in the early, you know, 70 once Lincoln had signed the land grant in 1864, while the Civil War was raging, he had time to do this. Um, all the Miwok had to go, except a few who were brought back to practice traditional crafts for the delight of those few well-heeled white tourists who John Muir encouraged to go and have a look, uh, rather than they might be in a sort of zoo. So this idea, very much personified in the art of the time, that the land was a cathedral to religion, never countenanced really the magnificence of the people that lived there. And it wasn't until the turn of the century that the Native Americans who lived there were started to be photographed and were shown to be quite as magnificent as the landscape in which they were operating. Thank you. Um, Jared, who uh, said he could listen to you all night um, and I can't wait to wait, wait to read the book when it arrives, was curious to hear your thoughts about gentrification and maybe how gentrification affects land and land ownership. Well, I mean, gentrification is of course largely an urban thing and I don't mean to dismiss his question, but it does allow me to talk about this phenomenon more apparent now in Britain at the moment than in America yet called wilding, which is another sort of form of gentrification. It began in a castle called Knepp, K-N-E-P-P, -P, just south of London in Northern Sussex, I think, where this couple, Charlie Burrell and Isabella Tree, um, had a 3000 acre estate, an arable farm, most of it, which wasn't doing terribly well. And they decided in the 80s and 90s that they would stop trying to grow cattle for beef or for milk or whatever, but would return the entire estate to the wild and to introduce livestock animals that hadn't been seen in Britain for years and let nature take its course. And it became a considerable success. And now they make a lot of money from glamping sites and bringing tourists to see animals which in the rest of Europe have effectively become extinct because of chemicals in the farm, you know, fertilizers and so forth, and the intensive farming which goes on in much of the rest of the country. So I have a, a number of friends who are very critical of this artificial rewilding. And I, if it were not dark here, would be able to look out from my window here in my study to an old farm country, Western Massachusetts. So the stone walls were mainly from Southern Russia who came here in the 1860s, tried to farm the land with modest success only, cleared the forest, planted things, but then left and went to more congenial parts of the country and left the land to rewild itself naturally. So I have the animals here and the birds here, the bears and the owls and the deer and the moose and all the things that Charlie and Isabella have in Knepp. I don't have any clamp, clamping sites, glory be, but this is natural rewilding as opposed to artificial rewilding. And I think it's, it's, a more, as I had nothing to do with it, I can say it in a disinterested way, it is a more honest way of rewilding. So I don't care much for what they've done, even though it's received an awful lot of publicity in Britain, and I'm happy just to let nature take its course on its own. I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to ask you one that is uh... Uh, about your, your, write, your writing and how you go about. Uh, Spike is curious how you manage to do all this research for your books. Do you have research assistants? Or are you on the road? What, what's your secret? Well, it's honestly no secret. It's just, um, I love what I do. I mean, it's one of those jobs that, you know, what do they say? If you love what you do, you'll never do a stroke of work in your life. I mean, I sign a contract to write a book and I go off and do the research and I immerse myself in it and I just think sounds rather trite to say it but it is an enormous privilege that I learn get to learn such a lot and some of the things I learn 
I put that on paper and people enjoy it or tear it to shreds, whatever. With this book, they've been generally very nice. So there's no secret really. I, I love what I do. I love researching. No, I don't ever have anyone that helps me in the sense of I acknowledge the help of a lot of people, but they have put me up or given me coffee or borrowed, lent me books or whatever. But no, I do not have any research assistants and I, and I love the writing process. So I'm a bit of a nerd, I'm afraid in that respect. A vaccinated nerd. <laughs> well, so grateful that you are. Um, I, I think for those who've had a chance to read the book, uh, you know that this is a fabulous book. Uh, like his, uh, like Simon's previous ones. For those of you who are waiting for your book to arrive or have not been able to crack it yet, uh, I, I, I promise you, you're in for a treat. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful book with a, so many things to think about in ways. The way you you do have made this a global story, um, I, I think, is very useful for us getting out of our little shells that we're in these days during the pandemic and and remembering that our our stories touch upon so many. Um, my 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 personal favorite was. At the end, as you start talking about cooperative ways of owning the land in Scotland, for example, and with land trusts, and, and I find that all um, very hopeful um, for, for the future. I, I, I invite uh, everybody to uh, read the book when it comes. I ask you to join me in thanking Simon Winchester for so graciously giving up his time tonight. We have just really, it's been a, it's been a treat and wonderful. So thank you. Um, Tess is reminding us, uh, you can reach uh, Simon on, follow, follow him on Twitter, Simon W. Ryder, um, and at simonwinchester.com. We hope that if you enjoyed this, that next week you'll join us. We have programs on uh, Tuesday night and Thursday night. On Tuesday is uh, Koa Beck, um, a former editor at Jezebel on White Feminism, From the Suffragettes to Influencers and Who They Leave Behind. On February 11th is Michelle Duster, who is an historian and teacher and great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells with her new book about Ida B. Wells. Um, so a couple of exciting, fun events to follow this one. For those of you who are not members, we invite you to look into joining and becoming a part of our community of people who love to learn and uh, to read books and talk about what we learn together. Simon, we hope that we can bring you back again. You, we believe it was with Alice in Wonderland that you you uh, came and spoke for. We look for, forward for a chance for you to come in person. If uh, your travels find you coming down to Philadelphia, you'll just stop in and we'll um, treat you to a cup of coffee and any books you need for your research. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it enormously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wish everybody a wonderful and safe evening. <laughs>